thank you so much for being here. Um, as Kay said, I'm Bailey Reitzel. If you saw me yesterday, you already know this, but I'm a longtime crypto journalist, started writing about Bitcoin in 2012, and now I mostly do events. Um, but I am here today because, well, I know a lot about Web3 gaming and NFTs. So I'm going to introduce the panel as well. But what I wanted to start with is Kay had mentioned, Kay had asked you all if you were gamers. And there was like three hands that went up. And so I know that all of you are also liars because everybody is a gamer. Everybody plays some kind of game, whether that is Web3 games, whether that is phone games or phone apps, or whether that is cards. We are all gamers. You do not have to be shotgunning Red Bull in your mom's basement playing League of Legends or Call of Duty to be a gamer. So I'm going to start with that. All of these people, we can talk about your gaming history as well. Right beside me here, this is Kenneth Sheck. He is the Director of Project Management at Animoca Brands. Thanks for being here. Um, we have Brian Akaka, the CMO of Laguna Games, who owns Crypto Unicorns there on the end. And then here in the middle, we have Renz Chong. He is the co-founder and CEO of BreederDAO. We might also have another panelist join us as well. She's running a little bit late, but I will introduce her when she comes up. So I sort of want to start by scene setting and for you guys to sort of introduce yourself and how you fit into the Web3 gaming environment. So Kenneth, I'll start with you. Where do you see Web3 games at right now? And then kind of tell us how Animoca fits in there. Well, I think um, actually set a really good baseline um, in terms of what GameFi can actually do and um, how do you actually put in NFT assets um, in the gameplay um, and having really robust community as well. Um, and of course, like we, we basically start from there and uh, basically looking at the gameplay and game loop and to see whether it's sustainable right, in terms of economy um, and how those assets actually amplify kind of the gameplay rather than people coming in um, for, for, the, for the gains. Yeah. Right? It's really for the fun. Yeah. Um, and Animoca, you guys invest in, what is it, like 300, 400 Web3 gaming projects? Well, 380 uh, companies, okay. right? Um, and then across the board, we, we have like about 90 plus tokens. Um, but it's not entirely uh, game five projects, right? There are some infrastructure play, there is some uh, digital identity play, right? So there, it's pretty diverse as well. Okay. And then, Renz, tell us a little bit about how you see the Web3 gaming space um, coming from BreederDAO and how that sort of fits in. Right. So if you look up like any game or any blockchain game, right, economy is at the heart of it. But for any game, right, uh, assets are really the underlying thing that uh, kind of like allows it to, to grow, right? So for any individual or for any gamer, crafting, breeding, or generation of assets is at the heart of it. So you can think of us as like blacksmiths or merchants within these games that create like the best assets that people are able to use to enjoy, um, expand their, or enhance their experiences within these games. And that's basically us. So in, in, in summary, you can think of us as like a factory or a manufacturer, uh, and then we produce these assets in support originally of the guilds in the future for, for anyone who would want to participate within these games. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna come back to that. But Brian, I want you to introduce yourself and just how you fit into the Web3 space. Sure. Um, yeah, well, so at Laguna Games, we're the developers of Crypto Unicorns. Um, and I think, you know, in 2022, we are in kind of an interesting point for, for Web3 gaming, given that we are in a web uh, bear market and we've kind of seen, uh, you know, Axie really dominate and, and capture the headlines, but then there's also certainly room for improvements and innovation. And I think that's kind of where we're at right now. We're kind of in a building phase and, a, you know, heads down, not necessarily with all the hype that we were having last year, but much more kind of a behind the scenes area. So, um, yeah, we're, we're quite busy ourselves, you know, developing new gameplay modes, new kinds of uh, mechanics and, and types of, you know, what we think is going to be innovative for Web3 game players. Talk, talk to us a little bit about how you play Crypto Unicorns. I have not played, but I looked at all of your OpenSea. You guys should definitely go check out Crypto Unicorns on OpenSea because it's adorable. My favorite one was a unicorn with an octopus horn. Yeah. It's just like an octopus sitting on its head. It's so cute. Anyway, tell us how you play Crypto Unicorns. Sure. Um, well, so we have two main NFTs. They're unicorns and land NFTs. Uh, you do need both to play. Um, so our, our game at its, I guess, core game loop, it's a farming simulation and a breeding game. 
Um, so it's similar to like a Farmville or you know, a, a Tamagotchi, right? You need to kind of regularly check in and interact with your unicorn and your land in order to harvest berries, grow items, um, and eventually kind of upgrade your land and, and upgrade your buildings. Uh, but we are planning to add more gameplay modes like a hyper casual mobile games, uh, jousting feature pretty soon, and racing as well. So a lot Jou of different ways. Jousting. Yeah, unicorn with the jousting. unicorn horns. With their horns. Okay, so cute. That's so adorable. Okay, um, well, so I want to come back to something that Renz was talking about. Basically, this idea of like a factory for these NFT assets, um, you know, hopefully good NFT assets that will help you win games like an Axie or Crypto Unicorns or whatever it might be. Um, you know, I think this is uh, the question of this bear market is sort of like where sustainability, where is the sustainability within Web3 gaming? And so I guess I want you guys to talk about the dichotomy between sort of having a specula speculatory or a speculation on those NFTs um, versus like a community that wants to play just for fun and be part of that community. Um, so I guess, Renz, I'll start with you. I'm sorry I'm throwing the hard question at you sure. right now. No problem. No, so I think like uh, it really depends on what kind of player you are, right? So even in, in, in more casual or more traditional games, these kinds of personalities already exist. So people still create accounts, uh, I guess, do the initial like RNG and then kind of like sell the account to a willing buyer, right? Uh, and then you have people who would just really grind and play and buy these other accounts just to be able to you know, enhance and, and, and maximize their experience within games. There are people who have a lot of time to be able to do those things, and there are also people who don't have like, that luxury of time, and hence they, they feel like they would just rather buy the account or buy whatever items they would uh, need to you know, be the strongest within the game. And so for me, like, this dichotomy has already existed from the very get-go. It's just enhanced here because uh, the, the economy kind of became like the highlight when we introduced like Web3 to gaming. Oh, I mean like Web3 uh, gaming in general. And this idea of economy like uh, being able to be converted to, or tokens being converted to fiat, or being able to be brought out into another economy that's not part of like, you know, the initial core game loop uh, has allowed people to, you know, some, some individuals to extract value. And that's the thing that people are looking at right now, which is why people have already introduced, you know, off-chain stuff like tokens not becoming or not being allowed to be extracted from the core game loop. Right. Uh, and and we're seeing a lot more of these like different economies and different strategies just to improve the sustainability. But a lot of people still believe that the sustainability will really come from like people just going for these games and then attracting more audiences to be able to just enjoy like the game and then just participate within the game. Um, not for its economic incentive, but just for the game itself. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and we've had our other panelists join us. Sorry, sorry to like call attention to the fact that this is happening, but this is Min. Um, she's a managing partner and co-founder at Ethereal Ventures. Um, I'm gonna have you brief, we're gonna get back on this topic. I'm not gonna leave this topic alone. Um, but Min, I just kind of want you to um, tell us a little bit about yourself and Ethereal Ventures and how it fits into this Web3 gaming environment. Sure, thank you for having me. I'm very sorry for being late. No problem. Um, so Ethereal Ventures is a global early stage investment firm that was established by the former investment team of Consensus. Uh, you know, we're, we're multi-chain, we invest across the stack. Um, I, in terms of sort of gaming, we have invested in a company in the UK called Playmint. Um, but our investment uh, sort of track record in Gaming sort of extends uh, way before that during our time at Consensus. We're actually very early investors in Axie and are very, very proud of how the team has grown since those early days. Um, we've also made investments in community gaming, Horizon blockchain gaming, and with each cycle of gaming projects, it's been really amazing to see the infrastructure and de developer tooling improve each time. And hopefully, as that continues to improve, so will the gamer experience. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to pass the tough question then to Kenneth as well. So we were talking backstage. It's like we want to see more uh, Web3 games where the landscape is pretty open for anybody to come in and play. So instead of having that high barrier to entry of like, you know, I don't know, a couple thousand dollar Axie um, or whatever it might be, some sort of environment where everybody can get in and play a base level game. So I want you to sort of talk about that idea and what Animoca companies uh, um, you've invested in that are maybe doing that? 
Yeah, um, so, so I guess to um, kind of like echo uh, what he just said <laughs> about, about breeding, right? Um, because actually coincidentally, we were working on like a horse racing game and then also involves breeding, right? Um, we, the, the topic started, um, to, we started talking about like, in order to be sustainable, we need the gamers to have emotional attachment to the assets, right? And then the work that you put in, the time that you put in, the data that you generate is supposed to be contained uh, within the NFT that you bought and you, you grow in value so that there are secondary market value so that uh, you can trade it and make a profit out of it. Um, but that's probably not the initial intention um, for playing the game, right? It's, it's really you put in a lot of time. Um, the gamers love the game. Um, and that's why like your NFT asset grow in value. Um, so that's really like, how, how we're thinking about it right now. Um, and, and talking about like the, the free to play versus like uh, pay to play, um, I, I think we have been having like really a, a recent conversation about uh, do we still want to go with pay to play, right? Because at the end of the day, we want to be inclusive. Um, we want people to come and actually experience the game and be like, hey, I really enjoy this, right? And then probably like other uh, sinks that you actually create for the assets, right? Um, uh, so rather than, oh, you, you need to buy a like, bunch of plans and, um, so that you can play the game, um, a lot, we basically excluded a lot of people there. Yeah. Um, Brian, I'm gonna pass that over to you as well to sort of talk about how you all have been thinking about your tokenomic structure in crypto unicorns. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think, so, sorry, the question about tokenomics? Yeah, just like how are you thinking about building out your um, building out your game so that it's not just like rampant speculation, so oh. that people want to enjoy the game and also sort of stay within that ecosystem. Yeah, I think you know part of our, our game play itself is is really designed to encourage interaction, and, and um, so you know the fact that we have our unicorns and they are meant to be bred and played with. Um, you know, we started with just ten thousand unicorns originally. Um, and we were quite, you know, upfront with the fact that we did not expect the, the price to necessarily increase. And in fact, we did expect it to, to decline as the breeding opened up and there was just more unicorns out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we did that and we made that game design choice very consciously because we wanted people to, to be playing the game and not just speculating. Um, so really, yeah, I think that overall, the more that we can get people engaged and having fun in the game versus just kind of standing on the outside and looking at it for financial gain, I think is a win for, for the company and the game and the sustainability of the community. Yeah. And then, Min, so how are you looking at the Web3 gaming space now in terms of investment? Is there anybody out there that you think is doing this correctly? Um, are there, you know, I know the narrative has shifted from play to earn to play to... Whatever. Um, I don't think we figured that out yet. But is there some sort of narrative that you're after in your investment thesis for games? Yeah, so we have three main criteria for any sort of gaming investment. And that helps us be quite disciplined with what we ultimately invest in. So, you know, our first and foremost, most important criteria is it has to be play for fun. So a lot of the team are ex-gamers. And if we try the game out and it feels a bit repetitive, it's not actually a fun game, um, you know, we're not quite sure what we're investing in. It feels like we're investing in more of a speculative sort of Ponzi, which might be fine for some, but you know, ultimately that doesn't really fit our thesis. The second element is the game engagement mechanism has to sort of be equivalent to the crypto mechanism. So what keeps like, you know, the player hooked, coming back, like, you know, what helps grinding, there has to be some sort of crypto element Otherwise, why introduce blockchain to your game to begin with? Um, and the third aspect that I think is becoming ever more important um, is what are the, what are the off-chain and on-chain elements of your game? So, so far, it's been quite challenging to bring a lot of things on-chain, which is why we've mostly seen like a lot of um, gaming projects focus on collectibles, like so, you know, sure. in-game assets that people can own and keep and you know you lead to a lot of custody and wallet issues that the like prior panelists have mentioned before um, but we do think that's starting to change so you know the holy grail is ultimately bringing a lot of blockchain logic on chain and you know you'll start seeing this with a lot of gaming platforms hopefully with application specific kind of blockchains as well um, and this will be really powerful because you can add sort of 
uh, different sort of time-based elements to the consensus, privacy, um, you know, just thinking about Axie, for example, like they had to build their own wallet and their own bridge simply because the tooling wasn't there. And that's kind of pointless. Gaming developers shouldn't and don't want to do that. Sure. So I do think there's still quite a lot we can do on the gaming infrastructure and dev tooling side to make it easier for game developers to just focus on building fun games. Awesome. Yeah. There's okay. There's so many threads there that I'm like trying to pick up in the best way possible. Um, let's talk about composability a little bit. You sort of touched on this. Um, you know, one of my favorite podcasts was um, I can't remember the name of the podcast, but Shaughnessy. It's it's Tim Shaughnessy who's interviewing Philip Rosedale of Second Life and Bill Gurley who is an investor in Second Life and many other things. And really funny part. They're like, can you imagine composability with these NFT games where you take your um, Grand Theft Auto car into among Us and just mow down all the characters in Among Us. Um, and it, so it's like a very similar process, um, you know, if you think about first person shooters into a kids game or any of these, any of these composable um, idea for, ideas for composable games, you know, it, there seems to be something missing in that conversation because, you know, you don't always want the characters from one game to go into another. Um, so I guess Jumping on that sort of narrative of Web3 gaming composability, Brian, I'll start with you just because you have a game. You know, are you encouraging people to create composable games for crypto unicorns? Um, and if so, you know, why are there limits? Where are the bounds of, of what you want them to create there? Sure. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting topic of, yeah, composability and interoperability. Um, I think we've kind of reached the point where we realize we can do this and now the question is should we um you know it doesn't make sense sure. from the brand perspective and like you said you know do we want hyper violent you know games to incorporate cutesy characters from other games maybe not you know maybe that's not such a good good brand match for us uh we are taking kind of a selected uh approach where we are inviting uh, developers to build within our un universe. Uh, so we have some hyper-casual mobile games that are being developed with our uh, unicorn assets that you can use. Uh, but we are not necessarily giving everybody just carte blanche to take our characters and put them in whatever game they want. Yeah. But the, you, you had said that the characters themselves, um, whoever owns them has the rights to them. So theoretically, they could take them and build them into other yes. games? Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. absolutely. Uh, so we have given commercial rights to our NFT owners, um, yeah. so they can do that. Uh, we do have an ecosystem fund that we have uh, created, and that's to incentivize developers to, to build within our ecosystem or our universe. Okay. And Renz, do you want to play off that? I mean, just in, in what you're seeing and all the different games that you sort of have the factory for. Right. For me, it's quite interesting that people are now thinking about these things. Uh, just like uh, Crypto Unicorns actually has its own builders program, right? And when, when we actually, or when they showcase like all of these different, like, uh, I guess, gameplays, right? You can see that people are already building these things, right? Uh, using the same IPs that have already existed. And this to me is what's interesting about crypto is that uh, the assets themselves get to outlive its original creator. Axie Infinity, its orig the, the, the origin gameplay may you know, last for one to two years, but you know, another game mode, uh, maybe a MOBA type or like, uh, I don't know, an FPS like with your, your Axie may, may succeed uh, or, or like may become very successful in that it lasts for like 10 years, right? And that to me is like uh, maybe one of the most uh, interesting and one of the more uh, value, one of the core value that, that blockchain offers to, to all of these like assets, right? Because you get to outlive its original creator and that you can do all sorts of things with it. Uh, it might not be you know, as good as the original or it might not be as similar to the original one, but because people own the IP and they can do all sorts of things with, 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 the, with the rights, right? Then they get to do all sorts of things with it. Yeah. And Kenneth, do you want to add, add there as well? You were kind of talking about IP rights back in the back, so. Yeah. Um, well, first, I would like to appreciate for uh, saying this composability is so much easier to pronounce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That, then interoperable. Like how, yeah, exactly. how many syllables are there in, in that <laughs> word? Um, yeah, like, I, I guess how, how we think about it is, is that I'm not sure if everyone, everyone knows, like, we um, kind of announced that uh, we, we're going to have, like, an open metaverse um, kind of like consortium uh, called uh, OMA3. So we're working with uh, Dapper Labs, uh, Sandbox, and the other veterans in the industry to basically, if you think about it, in the Web2 space, it's kind of like the, 
um, the Web3, the, the W3C, um, right? Kind of like standard, right? Um, yeah. to, to talk about like ontology structure and all that, like having that composability across uh, uh, different applications. And, and um, OMA3 is exactly that, right? Like to, to kind of like work together with the industry um, and build that standard together because otherwise the composability would only be limited to having your avatar to be showing up um, in other games or limited to like getting access to other games. Right. But at the end, it would be really fun when the economy can kind of like being uh, integrated together, right? And then you set certain kind of threshold. Um, and even the, if the game, well, touch with if the game dies, right? Your assets can be uh, living on the blockchain forever and can be used for other applications as well, yep. right? So long live the blockchain and long live your assets, right? Yeah, that's actually interesting because you could create like composability within these games, but you would just set parameters, right? So like I can bring my my car into a child's game, but it cannot kill characters, right? Yeah. So it can only drive on the roads. Um, it feels like, you know, that that's a long way from now, right? That's a lot of development. Um, I, I guess like jumping off that, um, that uh, narrative of, of development, how do we get traditional game developers and traditional gamers into the market, right? There's been a significant amount of pushback with both of those two categories in terms of, you know, NFTs and crypto broadly. Um, so I guess, who do I want to start with? Who wants to take that question? Like, how do we get these traditional gamers to not hate crypto? <laughs> Everybody's like, please don't take me first. Um, I'm going to go to Min first, though. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. Um, you know, we've asked ourselves and a lot of uh, other gamers this question quite a bit. And I do think in the last six months or so, we've seen some genuine interest from traditional gamers and game developers. Uh, you know, we mentioned PlayMint. But they, for example, you know, um, the founders and the team have nearly 20 years of experience across EA, uh, Disney, um, Unity, um, and you know, why they were interested in building a blockchain game is because they believe that they'll be able to do things that they can't do on traditional gaming platforms. Sure. And I don't think we're quite there yet, but you know, bringing gaming logic on chain will definitely help that. And a few examples of where we can go is, I think, you know, say for example, you mentioned like a composability and interoperable asset, like sort of transfer. Um, to be honest, I haven't he heard a of a lot of demand for that. You know, why would I want to bring my World of Warcraft sword into my Age of Empires game? There's not only is there not a lot of utility, but because there's not a lot of context, but if I try to barter it in the context of a different game, it'll actually probably be worth less because there's no utility. Um, not to mention all the IP issues that, you know, was mentioned, but I do think what will be exciting is, uh, for example, what if from the World of Warcraft universe that is so rich and, you know, you can tell I'm a WoW fan, back in the day, you can create sort of uh, derivative sort of fan games, right? Like they can fork it, airdrop to the same community, pay royalties to the original game, and people can like choose your own adventure. And that's yeah. when you perhaps could like add more composability to sort of the storylines and also to assets. Another element that I think is really interesting is identity and reputation. So bringing that cross-platform right now is completely impossible. Um, and is there actually like a pretty high correlation that if you're a good WoW player, you're also a good Age of Empires player, perhaps. Um, but you know, we can actually sort of put that to the test. But when you think about, say, e putting esports teams together, or doing anything competitive, I think these are identity really starts to matter. Um, and you can also think about in game bribes and other sort of like, you know, game theoretic uh, economic elements uh, that can be really exposed with identity, which right now the gaming platforms are keeping very proprietary. Yeah, that's. It's a really interesting point, and I think this question is also asking just like what are the use cases of NFTs and crypto, right? What makes this so exciting for gaming? So, um, Kenneth, I'm going to pass that to you as well. You know, like Animoca wasn't necessarily a Web3 gaming company previously, so why get into this space? Um, yeah, what's the use case here? Well, I think mainly is, is really um, in, in the Web2 space already in gaming, people are kind of like owning assets and, and actually trading them, right? So it's actually not a new thing. Um, and, and I guess like the, the narrative around digital asset ownership is, is super important, right? Like you, 
um, there, there are a lot of people generating data in, in, in the world, um, and, and actually they don't actually own their own data and their own assets, right? So uh, this is really just uh, giving it back to the community and having the community to co-create the ecosystem, right? Like through, for example, DAOs and more decentralized kind of voting uh, or decision making. Um, so, so that is really it. Um, and then we're also like working on, uh, actually working on digital asset ownership in terms of data. So your own, to digitize your own data and then providing the marketplace for you to trade and monetize it. And then you see the end-to-end -end monetization cycle of it, right? So that's, that's, I would say, is like a lower level of like gaming, uh, uh, kind of like asset ownership and, and monetization. Uh, but that's really uh, whatever we do is about that. Yeah. And then, Renz, I want you to add on here, too, like differences between traditional games and this Web3 gaming. Like, what's, wh why are we doing this? Yep. So I actually likened it to the start of like free-to-play where, you know, prior to that, the idea of like releasing a free game um, compared to, of course, like playing, uh, uh, paying to, to play the game, right, has never been heard of, right? And so people were like, okay, the quality of like free games are like shit. And, you know, all of these are because they're not funded. Mm -hmm. And so th people thought about like how it is that they can really monetize this because they are, these games are free, then you unlock like a huge audience, right? And now that you have a huge audience and apparently you can put ads, you can put like a lot of things to continue building and then monetize them, right? So the same with us, right? Uh, I think with blockchain gaming right now, people haven't seen the potential that they can unlock. But if you look at it, like, having the community own the project where they can you know, decide on, for example, like where the path uh, should go from, from this game or, or from the development of this game, or maybe even, like, even just with the meta, right? So you have these games like League of Legends where people or, or the developers try and adjust or nerfs and buffs like specific characters. What if you make that or you give that to the community for the community to kind of decide, right? And then people would vote on it, right? We don't really know like how that would affect it, but there are all sorts of possibilities. And I think what would attract like traditional uh, gaming studios from entering this is that there's a lot of models that haven't been explored for this one. Yeah. And innovation and development is very much you know, at, at the forefront of like any single game. Game studios who weren't, uh, I mean like games who weren't as famous before like Roblox and Minecraft were said to be ahead of their time during uh, 2006 and 2011 and they gained popularity recently just because they attracted like a different set of audiences. And I believe that the same can happen to all of the uh, titles that have already existed right now. That maybe, you know, we haven't just discovered the proper market or we haven't just discovered like the proper game type for each of these uh, titles. But eventually, you know, five years, 10 years down the line, these could be like the talk of the town, right? Yeah, fair enough. And then Brian, I want to pass it to you as well. I mean, I know you have been in traditional games previously um, from this Web3, uh, since this Web3 startup. So I guess talk to me about why you entered Web3 and then how you're you know, coaxing other developers to come in and build for, for crypto unicorns. Yeah, um, so actually our entire team pretty much comes from the Web2 gaming world, uh, okay. you know, largely from mobile game development. So. You know, we're very familiar with kind of why those players play games. Um, you know, a lot of our, uh, for instance, our game designers came from, uh, you know, some of the most popular free-to-play uh, mobile game companies. So for us, it's really about, you know, can we create some of those same, I guess, uh, value propositions of, of entertainment, right? To sure. us, that's the, that's the core utility for, for games is the entertainment more so than the financial side of it. Um, so it's about, yeah, create, maximizing the fun and, and lowering or reducing the, the barrier of entry. So uh, yeah. for, for us right now, you do need to purchase an NFT or two NFTs to play our game, but we are planning to release these hyper-casual games that are free to play. And okay. so that yeah, will yeah. allow people, uh, you know, like Min was saying, to, to try derivative products and, and, you know, help kind of bring people into the universe without having to necessarily make the, the initial cash outlay. Yeah, nice. I've asked this on other Web3 gaming panels as well, because as, as that narrative of like play to earn has sort of shifted, um, you know, the, the things that people say are like, oh, we need to focus on the fun of the games, right? And so the, the question is like, well, define fun, right? Like how do we, if you want us to focus on fun, how do we define fun? Um, and I think it, it probably changes for, for everyone, right? But um, this is sort of a question about what games you like to play also, um, to get to know y'all a little bit better. But 
for instance, I would like to see some you know, pretty simple mobile games for crypto. Um, so instead of thinking about building these like huge AAA games, so I'm thinking something like Star Atlas on Solana, that you, that's a huge game, it's gonna take many years. I just want you know, that mobile game that I play over and over again. Um, to be part of crypto. So Kenneth, I'll start with you. You know, what is fun in your mind and what would you like to see be turned into a crypto game? Yeah, I would say I would be most um, excited to see a casual game, kind of like territory and get, web free getting into it. Um, the, the reason being, like there are a lot of uh, hyper casual gamers um, that actually use, use those games to kill time, um, to get entertained. Uh, but at the same time, I would say what's gonna be fun um, potentially, we, we cannot miss like the social and community element in it because most of the casual games is kind of like one versus the robot, right? Um, yeah. So, so you, you, if, if there is like a social element and community element and the casual games and it ba ba basically your e economy is, is cutting across like different games, um, I, I would actually would love to see that. And it's high frequency as well, so it's like perfect for uh, a web free. Yeah, that's interesting because I forgot about like words with friends and chess with friends. Like those were very casual games, but you played with either like random people in the world or like friends of yours. Yeah. So yeah, that would be cool. And you know, I think all those people should get tokens as they play. <laughs> <laughs> they should get crypto tokens. Um, so Renz, I'll pass that to you. You know, what are you playing right now, and what do you want to see be turned into a crypto game? All right, I'd probably go for FPS uh, just because I like the idea of like you know. Playing with friends and shoot, shooting each other down. <laughs> yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> Not Every, killing them, of course, that. but like, you know, it's just a friendly <laughs> fire, right? But yeah, uh, I don't know. Like, imagine if you're eventually you'll be able to like uh, play FPS and then your face is there and like you're, you're the character, right? And then, you know, you're shooting down oh, that's people, your friends, or I don't thing know, right? You're talking about so, right yeah, now. of course. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's how I see it down the line where we can put ourselves like within these metaverses, within these games, uh, and then we can properly represent ourselves. And then whatever skins we have, whatever things that we put on ourselves, like can be represented or can be representative of us, not oh. because like the game allows for it, but we allow the game to do it. Yeah. Okay. Brian? Um, well, the game that I'm currently playing is Diablo Immortal, so okay. it's uh, you know more nice. of a Web 2 free-to-play game. But um, as far as like what do I think we can bring to the crypto uh, game industry, you know, I, I'm with you. I think that we need more casual, kind of lower, lower kind of skill-based, not as competitive, not as necessarily um, hardcore games. Um, yeah. You know, so so one game actually we have coming out, which I'm going to shill, but I think Please. it's relevant here, is a, it's a game called Unigachi. So it's basically a, a, <laughs> a twist on Tamagotchi. I think there's a fan out there. That has to be Leah. Yeah, I yep. think so. Okay. And uh, so it's actually going to be available on mobile. It's going to be a mobile game um, as well as nice. desktop. And so it's going to kind of bring that, that combination of persistent, you know, um, caretaking and emotional connection to a, to a unicorn NFT. I love that. <laughs> and then Min, what are you playing? What do you want to see? Well, we'd love to see more um, iterations on games like Dark Forest that feel quite crypto native. And also just, I think, are they're, they kind of probably fall under the casual game uh, category as well. But I think use an array of different cryptographic primitives where you know you can use your knowledge proofs for the simple kind of prove and reveal um, and you know a lot of integrity in like the back end with regards to storage and whatnot and yeah. self-sovereign identity I, I think in general like you know we having um, using zero knowledge cryptography to sort of speed up game engines is also something that we're really excited about and it feels like the technology is finally getting there and like there's some experimentation happening in the Starknet ecosystem, for example. Um, but you know, ultimately, Holy Grail is still bringing game logic on board because once you do that, then you have derivative products, you have a lot of choose your own adventure and um, you know, we're, we're really excited for the next 12 months in gaming because it feels like the things are coming together. Yeah, nice. I'm glad you brought that up. We, we have a few more minutes, so I'm going to throw another question out there. Um, we are at a Filecoin event, and so I should have been asking about storage. Um, so I'm going to do that now. Uh, how important is it that these, uh, these assets, these game assets, or the game world broadly is stored on a decentralized storage like IPFS um, and Filecoin? Maybe Renz, I'll, I'll throw that at you. Are you seeing most of your games are storing their stuff in a decentralized fashion so that if they go down, the players still have their assets. 
Yeah, I think that's going to be very crucial, like down the line, especially if we've already structured like interoperability in place, where people are able to use assets from, you know, uh, different, uh, where, where they are able to use like different uh, assets uh, across different chains, right? And these assets are not just, you know, utilized in, in one particular game, but right. it's actually being used on other games as well or other things as well, right? So putting it in a, in a decentralized over a centralized exchange allow it, you know, lesser, lo lower downtime, right? Uh, and then uh, as well as like being able to pull it even though the main server is down. So I feel like in general, when we talk about uh, interoperability, this comes into, uh, this, this becomes very crucial. Uh, so yeah, pretty much like if we're imagining a world where everything is owned not by you know these uh, centralized entities or not by a singular entity, mm -hmm. then putting it on a centralized storage is actually very crucial. Yeah, and Brian, I mean, do you host your crypto unicorns on IPFS? Uh, we uh, we use another decentralized service. Um, Boo. But yeah, I, I would <laughs> mention it here. Um, but yes, we we do. Uh, yeah, host okay, our cool. things on nice. decentralized. Um, and then, men, in terms of like thinking about investment for Web3 gaming, um, you know, is that integral to how you are investing? They need to be using the whole crypto tech stack. Um. I think we like a path to it, but we're also very cognizant that it's hard right now, right? Because it's not just the storage, it's actually making it available, retrieving sure. it, like, you know, who owns it? Like, you know, can the users are always focus on convenience and speed ahead of anything at the moment. So we're aware of the market and it just means we have to invest in a lot more infrastructure to make it easier for users, easier for game developers. Um, but ultimately, yes, I think, you know, uh, if, uh, you know, the whole point of Web3 Gaming is, you know, self-sovereign access control and ownership, then data storage has to be quite part of that equation. Yeah, right. Well, because the, there, there's another question here, which is like, do gamers really care? And I mean, I think they do, but only up until the moment where their asset is gone, right? Mm -hmm. um, they don't want to think about this any other time. Yep. Um, but Kenneth, I want to pass that to you as well, just you know, thinking about how your games are using the whole crypto tech stack. Like, Well, I think to, um, to Ren's point earlier, right, uh, uh, talking about um, people we basically we need to retain like the assets um, when, when even when the game is gone and all that. Um, but at, at the same time, I guess like, it's also important to be realistic uh, about what's achievable, right, um, with the current infrastructure. Um, so I guess like the, the most important um, assets data can be stored um, through IPFS Filecoin and all that, and which is very important. Right? But at the same time, we have kind of like explored kind of putting more game server data on chain as well, right? But um, I guess at the end is uh, why would we want to do that, right? Sure. Like this, for example, when we think about randomization, right? Like that needs to be on chain, right? Um, but besides that, like why do we need to put like all the data on chain when it's more efficient to run um, uh, through like a backend game, centralized game server? Um, and, and you raise a good point as well, right? Uh, when people actually uh, uh, need to take out their assets, right? So there's discussion. Uh, Rens also brought it up. Is like not all kind of um, assets or, or kind of data needs to be on chain. For example, sure. for the horse racing game that I just talked about, uh, we are thinking about like a game token that's completely off chain, right? Like until they need to withdraw it, right? But but that's like really balancing the usability um, and and the efficiency of using different kinds of, of design. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, so I think for all of you out there, you should be thinking about like what does need to be on chain versus off chain, um, because also the there's you know, like if I want to change my character, then I have to have like, you know, a separate character, basically, if you're putting everything on chain. Um, so yeah, that's for you all out there to take. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. Thank you guys so much. This was super interesting. Um, and thank you all for being a great audience.